this episode, we're going to learn about organics and about how British Columbia is one of the few regions in the world that can produce Pinot, Pinot, and Pinot. Welcome to Canada. Welcome to Wine Sense. So I'm with Gordon Fitzpatrick of Cedar Creek Estate Winery, and we're in the vineyard talking Pinot. And to our left, we have some Pinot Noir vines. Gordon, can you speak to me about the relation between these three Pinot varietals? Pinot Noir is a quintessential food wine. And you know, there's only maybe a half a dozen places in the world that you can do Pinot, and the Okanagan is one of it. Um, we've got enough heat, but it's not too hot in the northern part of the Okanagan Valley. And then the cooler temperatures in the fall are ideal for preserving those uh, wonderful flavors. And then Pinot Gris, how is it related to Pinot Noir? You can take a look here at the bunches. Um, and uh, we're actually, we've got a glass full of our Pinot Gris, and you can see the nice pinkish uh, hue to it. And so some people wonder, well, why isn't Pinot Gris, why is it white? And uh, the reason is, is that when we process this, the juice doesn't come into contact uh, with the grape skins. Uh, so it comes out white. In fact, if you process Pinot Noir the same way, uh, the juice would be uh, clear as well. It's just the contact with the grape skins, that's what uh, gives uh, red wine its, uh, its color. So one thing we haven't talked about is the other sibling, Pinot Blanc. In my experience at the restaurant, Pinot Gris flies off the shelves, Pinot Noir is a fabulous food wine, but Pinot Blanc seems to be the ugly duckling. Why aren't people drinking more of it? I think it just gets overshadowed by the other two Pinots. Some people refer to Pinot Blanc as a poor man's uh, Chardonnay, but it's really well suited uh, to the Okanagan. Um, but uh, people have also used it uh, as a, a blender as well, so it has been a little bit of a workhorse, uh, but there are some great uh, Pinot Blancs coming out of the Okanagan. They just don't get the fanfare. Pinot Blanc could possibly gain its identity from the Okanagan Valley. I can't think of really too many other places in the world that it's prevalent. I'm going to try a game with you here. Quick, rapid-fire food and wine pairing okay. of the Pinot family. All right. Let's start with Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris, gosh, you know, fresh salmon with uh, a nectarine salsa, dynamite. <laughs> Amazing, you're prepared for this. OK, Pinot Blanc. Pinot Blanc, how about crab cakes? I like that one too. And finally, Pinot Noir. <laughs> you name it, it's a quintessential food wine, but I think my favorite is a uh, duck confit. And you know what else is really good with Pinot Gris? This view. Cheers. Cheers. Pinot. Pinot and Pinot. What is the difference between these three wines? Pinot Noir, one of the oldest wine varietals and originated in the Burgundy area of France. It's also known throughout the rest of the world as the heartbreak grape because people who've tried to emulate those great wines of Burgundy have found it very difficult to do. But when everything comes together and a great Pinot Noir is produced, it is something special. Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc are two of the more successful mutations of Pinot Noir and can produce distinct and unique wines on their own. Pinot Gris is often known as the gray grape, although color on the vine can vary. The white wine it produces can go all the way from a light, crisp, lean and acidic white wine with flavors reminiscent of Granny Smith apple, citrus and honey, to a more medium bodied, viscous, unctuous wine with tropical notes, banana and pineapple. And it's perfect on a sunny day with a dozen oysters or a shrimp cocktail. And Pinot Blanc, sometimes known as the forgotten child in the Pinot family. It's usually vinified in stainless steel to preserve flavors such as melon and citrus. And while it's very good with certain foods like smoked salmon and pate, it's just as good on its own as an aperitif. We grow a lot of Pinot here in BC. What lends itself uh, to making a fabulous bottle of Pinot Noir with what you've got here? It can be a bit of a fussy grape and a fussy wine to make. Thin skin variety, so sometimes difficult to get color out of. It requires a lot of care and attention in the vineyard. Uh, you've got to be careful about cropping loads, proper sun exposure. All those things need to come into play. 
And then again, uh, sort of special attention into the winery as well as to how it's being processed. And one of my favorite wines to pair with at the restaurants, Pinot Noir, of course, it goes with so many different things. But what do you guys like to eat out here at the winery when you're enjoying a nice bottle of Pinot Noir? One of our favorite pairings is to have it with some of the salmon that's served out on the patio here. And as you said, it's a very versatile wine, which, which you know, the type of wine if I was going to a dinner party and I didn't know what was being served, uh, Pinot Noir would be one of the bottles that I'd gravitate towards because uh, it, it is very versatile. It doesn't tend to overwhelm dishes. Yeah, you got a real option of it going well, possibly with the chicken, maybe with the scallops, definitely with the salmon, and even so far as maybe a, a summery lamb dish that's served yeah. with some tomatoes. But speaking of that salmon, obviously walking through this vineyard has gotten us a little hungry. Do you think you have any salmon back at the at the winery to cook us up? I think I'm in. I'm in. Beautiful. Let's go. Beautiful, thank you. Well, Randy, thanks so much for uh, having me as your guest here at Inkamip uh, Cellars. It's absolutely gorgeous. And thanks so much for getting up early and, and cooking this feast for us. Uh, yeah. Little Pinot friendly uh, dishes here mm -hmm. venison sausage, some candied salmon, beautiful sockeye, uh, and obviously these great tomatoes and beets. Uh, just like excited, excited to sit down and okay. eat something. Thanks for coming. Cheers. One of the most amazing things about wine is that it changes year after year, and every single vintage is a whole new ballgame. While it may seem daunting to have to learn all of those different vintages and years, more often than not, when you're out for dinner, a restaurant has hired an expert who's done that research for you. My advice to you is to ask questions. The wine list in front of you has been written by someone who's usually passionate and paid to know their stuff. So if you ask the right questions, possibly he'll help you get a bottle of wine that's broken your mold. So I'm here at the famed Dark Horse Vineyard of Inniskill and Okanagan Estate. And I was supposed to be having a chat with winemaker and viticulturalist Shandor Meyer. But for some reason, there's been a bit of a mix up, and they've got me picking grapes. Hello. Can I help you to harvest some Pinot Noir grapes? Hi, are you Shandor? Yes, yes, Hi, nice, nice, to, nice to, meet to meet you. Man, I thought we were being talking about Pinot, but I, I've been making my way up the rows oh, picking really? grapes. Oh, that's you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you've got some beautiful grapes here, and I've noticed over the years that Pinot Noirs seem to have gotten darker and darker in color. Yes. <laughs> Why is that? Yes, it's true. Well, viticulture is trying to balance the possible uh, most ideal yield at the vineyard, means that we don't want to overproduce this variety. In fact, getting not too low crop, but, but uh, the right crop level per acre gives you a better concentration also, viticulture is uh, taking care of the canopy, leaf removal, shoot thinning, bunch thinning. So by end of the season, they get a nice, ripe, uh, even fruit for the winemakers. And how about tonnage? Are you really monitoring how, how much grapes you're growing per acre here? Yes, yes, we average about three tons per acre, which is not, not, not too low, but not, not certainly not on the high, uh, high level per acre. So this way I, uh, I will get a nice even fruit, fully ripe. When we crush these grapes I use a special yeast and a fermentation technique in order to get the concentration and a, and a possible uh, best potential out of the grapes. Now Pinot Noir, unless I'm mistaken, is a, a thin-skinned variety. Does that present any problems when you're cultivating it? At harvest time if the weather is moist and, and too wet the, they might uh, occur some botrytis rot in the grapes. Also, if botrytis attacks uh, blue-colored berries, uh, that fungus destroys the color in that. So we certainly want to take off any rot, or uh, the best uh, thing is just to produce a healthy fruit. So there is no absolutely no botrytis berries in the fruit. Now, I know you spend some of your time working with Pinot Blanc as well. Yes. How come, if it's a relative of Pinot Noir, 
is it so much easier to harvest? They, I've never heard them refer to Pinot Blanc as a heartbreak grape. <laughs> no, well, uh, Pinot Blanc looks a little bit easier to produce. If, if uh, you manage the vineyard properly and get the right uh, time, the grapes into the cellar, then the, the sugar acidity in balance, it's certainly, you can produce a nice uh, table wine with a nice fruit and acidity. But with Pinot Noir, we're dealing with uh, certainly more depth in aromas and flavors and color and tannin and, and etc. So it's more difficult. And with the finished Pinot Noir, obviously you like to drink them as well as make them. That's right. Is there a particular food that you think might go well with it? Certainly with, with uh, chicken or, or a lighter type of uh, foods, uh, it certainly uh, would go well. I find it is one of those wonderful crossover grapes yes. that breaks the rule of white wine with fish, red wine with meat. Yes. Because hardier seafoods like salmon or rich scallops or even halibut, I think can go very well with a exactly. Pinot Noir. Exactly. So I know that uh, you need to get back to the winery and start crushing some of these grapes. Shall I come with? Well, I would suggest to stay because you got to go to the end of the row, you know, so there's still time to go. <laughs> I'll see you down there. See you. Proper wine storage. What are the rules? Of course it would be incredible if everyone could have their own wine cellar, but most of us simply don't have the space. So here are a few tips to store wine properly at home. Firstly, keep it in a dark place. Direct sunlight is an enemy of wine and can attack it very quickly through the glass bottle. Secondly, cooler is better. It doesn't have to be in a refrigerator, but definitely a cool dark place in your home can help the wine tremendously. And thirdly, once you've put the wine down, try not to move it again until you're ready to drink it. Small vibrations such as refrigerator or generator or even heavy traffic can affect the wine while it rests. And one thing I like to do is when I've laid my wine down, make sure it's on its side so that the liquid is touching the cork. If that cork doesn't have liquid and it starts to dry out, then oxygen enters the wine and it deteriorates rapidly. If you follow these quick, simple rules, you'll be able to drink great wine for years to come. So I'm here with Mason Spink of See Later Ranch, and we're talking Pinot. Pinot Gris, to be exact. And as a matter of fact, I think that Pinot Gris has just passed Chardonnay as the most widely planted white grape in British Columbia. Well, I know you guys do a great Pinot Gris because we're tasting it right now. Why don't you tell me about the process? Well, Pinot Gris um, throughout the valley can be done in different styles. You can get a sort of a Pinot Grigio style, which is very crisp, acidic, um, light. And you can get a more of a heavier oak sort of style, which is more rounder and fuller bodied. We'd like to do one that's sort of in between both. So we take our fruit, we bring it into the winery. We'll do a bit of a cold soak on the fruit. So we get extract a bit of the phenolics out of the skin, um, get a bit more aromatic sort of compounds out of the skins. And then some of it will go to stainless steel for a nice cool stainless steel ferment, and the other half will go to barrels. And we'll ferment them both dry, and then um, we'll blend them together for the final bottle. And so what is the advantage of having some barrel and some stainless steel ferment? You get the best of both worlds. This um, makes it more of a sort of a food approachable wine. You've sort of got a bit more palate weight from the oak, but then you still have some bright acidity from the stainless steel fermented uh, portion and it, it balances the wine quite nicely. I keep hearing these cannons in the background. Are they recreating the Civil War somewhere around? Or? We use the cannons for uh, bird control to scare the birds away so they don't, they don't eat our crop. And, and yeah, but we're, we're quite safe. As far as food is concerned, you're bringing this bottle to a party. What are you hoping they're serving? It can go with many different foods. Um, you know, some oilier fishes, some heavier fishes, um, duck or, or chicken. Um, it's a very uh, sort of food friendly wine. I agree. At the restaurant, we always have tasting menus and we always pair wine and Pinot Gris is one of those ones that we use invariably. Well, judging by the great job you've done with this wine, I can see that uh, Pinot Gris is definitely a great varietal in British Columbia and one, hopefully one that's going to make some great wine for years to come. Thank you very much. Cheers.
Over the past few years, organic winemaking has grown in popularity with wine drinkers and grape growers the world over, and British Columbia is no exception. Next up, I'm going to speak with two of British Columbia's top organic wine producers, both of whom grow Pinot Noir, and see if they can shed a little light on the subject and hopefully let us know why organic is getting a whole lot more popular. I'm with Carnell Sadu of Kalala Organic Estate Winery, and it's a good thing because we're talking organics. Carnell, what is it about British Columbia that lends itself to growing organically? We have really dry growing conditions, so you can grow really good to Pinot Noir on this end of valley because Pinot Noir likes this kind of weather and uh, because they need cool nights, which we get here uh, every night and uh, we still have warm days here. And what is it that made you choose the organic path? I choose the organic path because I think about the future. Future is our kids. Like, uh, I don't want my kids to get exposed to the chemicals here, right? So I choose it. They can come into Vinjard any time they can taste the grapes. And I can't help but notice this jungle-like row that we're walking through. Yeah. Incredible plants and flowers of all types. Tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, organic Vinjard never sort of look like a golf course. <laughs> and uh, all these, people call them beads. For me, they're all plants. They grow, they die back, they add a nutrient, they add a fiber to the ground. They build up as well. Beautiful, and what kind of soil are we looking at here? Uh, this uh, is more uh, lots of rocks in the soil, and uh, it's uh, some loam. It's a really good drainage. It's a, a sandy loam and a rocky soil, lots of rocks in it. Sandy loam seems to be one of the identities yeah. of British Columbia yeah. in terms of our so soil structure. For growing a grape. So Carnell, I'm a customer yeah. and I want to know why should I choose organic wine? Oh, because it's good for you. It's a healthier <laughs> choice for you. And uh, you're not drinking too many residue chemicals in it. So, I mean, this is a wine that's and good for you yeah. and good for the environment. It is. It's a pretty easy it decision. Not, it is an easy decision because we are not uh, making any damage to the environment uh, as compared to the conventional. And I noticed we've got some grapes here that are looking really good. Yeah. How can you tell when they're ready to be picked? First thing, we come taste them. These ones taste sweet yeah. and they're then, not tannic. Yeah, then we check the seeds. You see the seeds are almost brown. Getting brown is also indication that the grapes are getting ready to pick. So by the looks of that, yeah. we're close. Yeah. Well, Carnell, I really truly wish you the best of luck and I can't wait to taste your wines on release. Right. Cheers. <laughs> wow, that was truly amazing, Stephen. I love the way the sound is in this room. It's just the echo and it's incredible. And I knew that I was coming here to talk organic winemaking and, and viticulture, but you know, I didn't know we were gonna start in a pyramid. Now I know that most of the wine that comes in here to do its aging process is 100% organic. When you're farming organically in BC, do you come across any hardships? Well, the beautiful thing about farming in British Columbia is we have the least amount of pests. It is the easiest to go organic here than any other region because we have very cool evenings. Like if, you, if you're farming in hot regions like California, it stays hot at night and those bugs go crazy. And there isn't much you can do to keep them down. And when you have a lot of rainfall, like in Eastern Canada, it's also very difficult to be organic, but it's very easy to, to do it here. In fact, I've been hoping and trying to get a lot of other uh, wineries and vineyards to go organic. What, if any, uh, reasons could you come up with that they're not ready to change? There is a definite economic uh, difference. With uh, organic growing, we get far less crop. Um, 
instead of uh, five to eight tons per acre, we're lucky to get two to four. Um, but in a way, that's a good thing because as most people will agree, the lower the crop, first of all, the healthier the vineyard so it, it doesn't get winter damage. And second of all, which I think is as important, you get a better tasting grape overall. The wine is better. So um, for those two good reasons, I would say in the long run, it's economically not that much different because if the chemical vineyards uh, get sick uh, and die of viruses or you know, other things, then they're down for a few years, whereas we're keeping on going, right? So in a way, it, it, it could be the same kind of economics. Thanks so much, A, for talking organics and helping clarify a few of those things. You bet. I don't see now why anyone would even hesitate to go organic when oh, they're yeah. choosing their bottle of wine. Stephen, cheers to you and Summer Thank Hill. You. Thank you. Can you play us out of here? <laughs> yeah, we'll play something here. Who would have thought that a grape so difficult to grow can produce wine so easy to drink? The three Pinots, though related, have managed to produce wines of varying styles that appeal to varying tastes. The verdict is in, and while its origins may be elsewhere, the Pinot family has found its place in British Columbia. And in my opinion, we may have produced some of the best value Pinots in the world.